this crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. This crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. And the American people must be patient. You can see in the foreground the flags of the 117 member states which are flying. And now the car approaches the door. This surely is a moment which will live in the memory of those who witness it. Pope Paul VI, the spiritual leader of more than half a billion people all over the face of the earth, inheritor of a lineage of 2,000 years, is greeted in this house by the chief representative of a world organization made up of member nations who can count over two billion people of many kinds and many creeds, an organization which man brought into being 20 years ago. His Holiness descends, is greeted by the United Nations Chief of Protocol, who of course met him at Kennedy Airport this morning. The Secretary General awaits inside the threshold of the United Nations building. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from York Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today, again in collaboration with my brother in Christ, Tom Fress from the Ministry Inquisition Update, who I hope you still know uh, from last week and the week before and the week before, because I am so glad and I'm so blessed by the Lord to do these readings and discussions with Tom on my side, because I really think that the Holy Spirit put in a team together that even the papacy will have problems with, the papacy who is the biblical, historical and prophetic antichrist. Hello Tom, how are you doing? I'm doing fine and uh, very happy to be here and uh, continue our study. Yeah, me too. Uh, listen, last time in our broadcast, I spoke in the beginning of our broadcast that was dealing in Steve Wahlberg's book, End Time Delusions, about the Battle of the Isms. And uh, the Battle of the Isms, I spoke of a bull from the Pope that he released within the very few first years of after the founding of the Jesuit order, who were uh, inaugurated, let's say, by, uh, by the Pope Paul III, Antichrist Paul III in 1540. The Jesuit order itself was founded 1534. That's something else. Of course, on the day of the Assumption of Mary, 15th of August, but that's a whole different story. Um, the point is that I was speaking about the bull and I knew what it contained, but I didn't know the name anymore. I didn't know the true date of uh, publication. I'm quite sure, or I was quite sure it was 1542, and I told you I look it up and we are going to go uh, into that reading today. So we are still of course, in the book and uh, reading and discussion of End Time Delusions by Steve Wahlberg, as you see on the picture here, we are in the chapter that is called The Battle of the Isms. That is what you see here. That is uh, this chapter called. It's chapter, let me just check for reference that I don't tell anything wrong. It is chapter 19, Battle of the Isms. This will be the third reading of that. 
we should continue on the first but last uh, last but one paragraph on uh, page 113 on august 15th as i just told you the day of the assumption of mary 1534 ignatius of loyola founded the society of jesus and we are going into that but before that i want to tell you about this bull that i was speaking of and that bull is called injunctum nobis as you can see here underlined in the yellow um, this bull is mentioned in the book by Karl Theodor Griesinger, who wrote a two-volume book of the history of the Jesuits from the big, uh, about their secret and open um, doings from the beginning of the order up to the moment that he wrote the book, and that was in 1866. Here you have a cover of the book, yeah? a complete history of the open and secret proceedings from the foundation of the order to the present time. Um, it has more than 800 pages. Uh, as you can see here, the PDF has about 850. I read the book in German, old fracture German writing on my YouTube channel years ago. I'm republishing it on my German only, only channel for the moment <clears throat> because many people didn't get the first uh, publication of my videos, so I'm doing it again. And I really love the book of Karl Theodor Griesinger, where he tells us a lot about the story of the Jesuits. And especially the very first, the very first few years of the Jesuit order are very much of importance. We spoke last time about, Tom and me, about the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent was opened in 1545, ran for 18 years until 1563, with three big gaps in between. There were actually three or four sessions only. The rest was time for <laughs> probably, you know, finding new anathemas and all that stuff against the, against the Protestants. And it's not a funny thing, but I'm just uh, laughing a little bit about convening a council over 18 years and only have three or four actual coming together where they do the sessions. Anyway, that was the, as we said last time, Counter-Reformation Council. Yeah? That was the moment when really Rome uh, stroke back after it got a strike from Martin Luther and other Protestants and reformers in the beginning of the 16th century when the Roman Catholic Church was on the height of its rule and they fomented that in a council uh, I do not know where that took place but that was between 1513 and 1517 then the Reformation came came uh, the reformation made clear to the people that who all of a sudden could read the bible in their own language that the papacy is was and always will be the antichrist of scripture prophecy and uh, history yes. thank you tom yeah uh, and the point is that because of that uh, the Roman Catholic Church lost a lot of members, lost a lot of money, and the Vatican lost a lot of power. Even lands, even countries rule over kings. They lost because these kings all of a sudden turned to the knowledge of the Bible. These kings all of a sudden gave their uh, citizens the possibility of religious freedom, something that they never have before because there only was one church. Now there were other churches. All of a sudden Luther founded a church, founded the church on sola scriptura, at least as he said in that time. Listen, Luther was not a saint in the regard that he was absolutely perfect. Like every man, he has its mistake. He had its mistake, his mistakes. And Tom so often says it is easy to get a man out of Catholicism, but it is a much harder thing to get Catholicism out of a man. Even Luther had some problems in all that. But what Luther did and what the other reformers in that time did was give a blow to the papacy, a blow to the Vatican, and they understood that they had to fight back. They founded the Jesuit order, as we just read in Steve Wolberg's book, 1540, the 15th of, um, uh, in 1540, the Jesuit order was inaugurated by Pope Paul III after the founding of the 15th of August in 1534. Now Griesinger tells us about the very first few years the Jesuits existed. 
and you can look up the bull that we are talking about in this link of Wikipedia that you see here, because that will be uh, given to you in the description box of this video. Um, you can find this bull in Junctum Nobis still on the internet. You have to uh, I did a few of a search because when you get through the normal listings in Wikipedia of the paper bulls, it doesn't show. So I looked a little bit deeper and anyway, I found it. The link will be provided and now I'm going to read to you and Tom will of course interrupt me whenever he thinks appropriate. I will read to you two pages of the book of Griesinger, which is a wonderful book as I told you about. The book is actually so quote unquote wonderful that the very renowned Jesuit researcher Eric John Phelps used this book as one of his, um, how do you say this, uh, sources to write his own book. You know, he wrote this book, um, uh, Vatican Assassins Wounded in the House of My Friends. And he wrote that book on the base of many, many sources. And one of the sources is the book of Griesinger. So I say that if a researcher like Eric John Phelps, whose historic research is uh, to be lauded, what he does there, takes this book as one of the sources to his studies, it is not wrong of us to take a short look into this book. Now, <laughs> I went on ranting for almost 10 minutes, but I'm sorry, I need to, to lay a good ground before I read this to you, because we are leaving the normal study of end time delusions to give you a little bit an idea about this and why we are doing this. Um, let me go on with my ranting for a minute or two, please. That is because we have today the 28th of April 2021 and the last week's broadcast was just on the premiere on my YouTube channel and about uh, six days ago it was, on the, uh, it was shown on Tom Fress's YouTube channel. And we got a lot of comments from people who said, I never ever heard, neither in the church, neither in the school, of quote-unquote counter-reformation of quote-unquote Council of Trent, of quote-unquote the Jesuit order or whatever they were doing. I never ever heard that. And that's why Tom and I think it is so absolutely necessary during this broadcast, during this reading and discussion of the book of Steve Wahlberg, to give the founding of the Counter-Reformation, let's call it this way, a little bit more attention than Steve Wahlberg in his book does. And that is not because he doesn't think it is necessary or important, but he writes so many th about so many things in his book, he cannot give this attention to every little detail. And that's what Tom and me are here for, that we give more details to the things that we think are appropriate for your understanding of the history, because when you understand history and you read the Bible and you understand prophecy, history and prophecy shake hands and all of a sudden you got a complete different understanding of the whole world. And therefore, you need to know of the Counter-Reformation and you need to know, and this is what the bull is about, you need to know what power the general of the Society of Jesus really has. You don't need that from conspiracy theories. You don't need to hear that because your neighbor said that or because you overheard that in a, in a bar where you were drinking a beer or whatever and you heard something like that. No, we are showing you real papal sources where it is founded that the general of the Society of Jesus has even more power than the white pope. It is black on white, and that's what we are going to show to you. Well, before I start reading, Tom, do you have a question, or shall I proceed? I only want to sum up what you're saying. The Jesuits were created for the purpose of absolutely destroying, annihilating Protestantism. Uh, the Protestant Reformation broke out, the printing press uh, was producing Bibles in the, in, the, in the vernacular, and people were reading the Bible like never before in history, and they were all coming to the consensus that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. And Rome saw her own death before her eyes. The Roman Catholic Church was facing complete and utter abandonment by Christians reading the scriptures for themselves. And so immediately they created the Jesuits to stop 
the flooding out of the Roman Catholic Church. I, I refer to it as the arterial bleeding of Catholics out of the Catholic Church. You know, pretty soon the church is going to bleed to death and there's nothing left to keep it alive. Okay, so the Pope lives in the paper, lives in in the in the Vatican all by himself. He rules no one. He, he is a spiritual and temporal ruler of no one but himself. See, that's what the Vatican was facing. It was a critical situation for the papacy. All of a sudden, the whole world was beginning to discover what you and I and every other historicist has discovered: the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, and we maintain that. Okay, so the Jesuits were created to destroy Protestantism, which means they were created to destroy the idea, the notion, or the belief, and the teaching that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. That was the primary, number one object, uh, uh, object uh, of the Jesuit order was to stop the belief that the papacy is the Antichrist, okay? And then punish, if not annihilate, the Protestant reformers and everyone who holds the Protestant position, which is, again, the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. It's a very serious business with the Jesuits. And right after their founding in 1540, the first thing they did was give Martin Luther what he wanted, only not what he really wanted. Martin Luther wanted a free and open council to deal with serious issues facing the Roman Catholic Church, demanding reform. And when they convened the Council of Trent, which was put forward as an attempt to settle some of the differences, instead what it was was a complete and total retrenchment of the Roman Catholic Church in a restatement of her beliefs and traditions and practices and Roman Catholic canon law in the form of dogma. An you outright either... declaration of war against Protestants, right? Absolutely. No yielding to Protestantism. They, they use the council to restate Roman Catholic teaching, Roman Catholic dogma, Roman Catholic, you know, uh, 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 Roman Catholic canon law, the whole nine thing, whole nine yards, and it made it apparent both to the Protestant reformers, Roman Catholics in the church, and the kings and queens and princes and potentates of the world that Rome was going to brook no tolerance with Protestantism. It was declaring an all-out war of annihilation, an unrepentant annihilation against Protestantism. It was a course that they set for the Roman Catholic Church that they never intend to change. Okay, That's the environment that you and I and every Christian lives in today. We live in a day when there is over our heads a threat of permanent annihilation of everyone who holds the Protestant or the historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy, which is Jesus is the Christ and the papacy is the Antichrist. The 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. There is no future fulfillment. And, the, and that is our stand. And they have sworn and they are still, to this day, fighting the war against Protestantism. And their secret weapon was futurism, and it did exactly what the Jesuits intended it to do. It completely destroyed Protestantism. And uh, Vatican Council II, which happened in 1965, 200 years later, or rather, Let's see, the Council of 400. 40, 400. 400, years, yeah, 400 years later, they declared all-out victory over Protestantism. It had been rendered death. Uh, it had been rendered uh, virtually committed suicide because it taught in all of its churches futurism. A biblical, a biblical important number, the 400, right? Yeah, speaking of yeah. 400 years yeah. of captivity in Egypt, for example, speaking of yeah. 40 days or 40 years wandering through the desert, a time of cleansing. Yeah, yeah. 
the, you can you can almost understand that the Roman Catholic Church used the time between the Council of Trent and the Second Vatican Council as a time of cleansing to get, whether get rid of the Protestants in the meantime or to turn them back to Mama. That's and they right. used of and they used of course that for that because you used the word swore, Tom, they used the oath of the Jesuits, the fourth oath of induction that I also read on my channel years and years ago, and that is maybe um, appropriate. I will talk to Tom about that after the broadcast, that maybe we pick that up and we discuss that oath once again, because especially in the light of the Council of Trent and the Counter-Reformation and the founding of the Jesuit order, what we are speaking over here right now, the Jesuit oath is very much of importance for every Bible-believing Christian to know and to understand what is said there. Please, Tom, I didn't want to interrupt okay. you that long, but I, I, I thought that was an important point. And just adding to what you said, you can read those Jesuit oath, that Jesuit oath, and by that oath, you can literally see what they've done in following that oath to the letter. And they, they were successful in destroying Protestantism. Now, now people are going to say, now, wait a minute, Tom, wait a minute. You say Protestantism is dead? I say, yes, indeed, it's dead. Stick a fork in it, it's dead. Okay? Well, 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 well Tom, well, well, Tom why, why is it dead? What makes it dead? Simply ask the question, who's the Antichrist? Nobody knows. That's proof, inarguable, proof positive. Protestantism is dead. Nobody knows who the Antichrist is anymore. And Nobody many, can describe him. And many who know, Tom, many moment. who know, Tom, don't profess that it is. They don't go out on the streets and shout it from the rooftops like we oh. do in making these videos and all that stuff, that we put it out in the open. You and no. I, we, we, we take no second guess on that. We say the papacy is, was, and always will be until the return of Jesus Christ, the Antichrist of Scripture, prophecy, and history, point exactly. blank. And many of the quote-unquote Protestants who even say, oh yeah, I know the Pope is the Antichrist, I have never heard them say that out in the open, never teaching that. There are very few uh, internet ministries or YouTube channels or whatever who do that in the way that we do it. And that is not to clap ourselves on the shoulder. But the point is just to know that the papacy is the Antichrist and to do something about it, meaning shouting it out in the world and make your knowledge and the knowledge of the Bible known to the world is something else. And that is not happening so much. Very, very few people out there produce videos where they state that the 70th week of Daniel was completely and perfectly fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. Very, very few people do that as we do that. And that is necessary because you cannot preach Christ without preaching Antichrist. And therefore you have to shout it from the rooftops where he is. Everywhere you go, everywhere you stand, every time that I'm in the taxi and I speak a little bit about religious things with people who are driving my cab, who are driving in my cab, clients, I say, the papacy is the Antichrist, the papacy is the Antichrist, every time I say that, and here and there, it will fall on fruitful ground, at least I hope. And that is the point why Tom says, Protestantism is dead. Stick a fork in it, it won't move. That's right. Protestantism, and people can call themselves Protest Protestants till the cows come home. But if they don't know who the Antichrist is, and they're not protesting against him, they're not Protestant. They are not Protestant. Full stop. And... Uh, most people who call themselves Protestant today, if you were to tell them the Pope was the Antichrist, they'd argue with you. Well, what does that tell you? Oh, they laugh at They're you. They're not Protestant. They've forgotten what we knew 400 years ago. They believe a fairy tale now. They believe the 70th week of Daniel's future. by, And they deny their, their own Christ, the one who died for them, the one who, who they profess with their mouth. They reject him when they say the, the, the 70th week of Daniel is future. 
because Jesus was the fulfillment of the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. It's a done deal. Now, to deny that the 70th week of Daniel is fulfilled, that's a denial that Jesus was the Christ. That's where Protestantism is today. They even deny that Jesus is the Christ. That's what they say. <coughs> That's what they imply when they say the 70th week of Daniel is future. You know, they profess Jesus out of one side of their mouth, and they deny he, was, he ever came to the world in the flesh out of the other side of their mouth. That's just how perfectly the Jesuits have destroyed Protestantism. And you, can, you don't have to take my word for any of this. Go out, walk down the street, or you ask people, are you a Protestant? What makes you a Protestant? They can't tell you. They can't tell you. And many of them who know something about this will say, well... I'm really not Protestant. I'd rather think of myself as an evangelical. I don't protest anything. Okay, protesting is wicked. <laughs> That's just how destroyed Protestantism is. The Jesuits don't have to war against Protestantism any, anymore, any more than they'd have, to, they'd have to plot against a cadaver in a grave. What they're doing now is taking reparations for what the Protestant Reform did 500 years ago. 500 years ago, everybody knew. Everybody that was a historicist, everybody who read a Bible, everybody who was a Protestant knew who the Antichrist was and what function he played in the world. Okay? They could name him. They could draw a picture of him. They could give people his house address. They knew where he lived in the Vatican. Okay? There were no secrets. And that's why the Vatican had to pull out all the stops to destroy the, the, the knowledge that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. And all you've got to do is walk up and down the street, go from church to church to church, and ask people a question, who's the Antichrist? And you can prove it for yourself. Protestantism is dead. It's pushing up daisies. There's nothing left of it. Not even a breath. Okay? And that's why people think you and I and others like us are just outrageous. We're bringing all this persecution on ourselves. Because we've got this cockamamie conspiracy theory that somehow the Jesuits or the Vatican are ruling the world. You'll hear that from the churches. That's just how dead Protestantism is. The very faith of Christ is dead in this country when those who call themselves Christians insist that the 70th week of Daniel is future. That's just how dead Bible-believing Christianity is. We've been defeated. And we didn't even fight back. The Jesuits infiltrated all the churches. They infiltrated all the seminaries, and even the greatest seminary in this country, Dallas Theological Seminary, all oh, the most highly respected so-called Protestant or Baptist uh, seminary in the country, cranks out futures every day. They're the most prominent futurist preachers and teachers there is. They work for the Jesuits. They are the knife in the belly of Protestantism. Every Protestant pastor that comes out of Dallas Theological Seminary is a dagger in Christ's belly. Okay? You think I'm being melodramatic? People would just love if this was just melodrama, but it's the truth. And yeah. they know it. in the marrow of their bones, they know I'm telling them the truth. And this is, Tom, why we are learning more about the Jesuit order and the real power of the Jesuit order in this reading. That was the idea. That's right. And that's why I'm going into right now there into this go. book. Okay? Go right after it now. So Carl Theodor Griesinger says in his book on page 58, already in 1543, 
Two years only after the foundation of the order, and we see here a little bit mix up with the number of years, because the order was actually founded in 1534, was inaugurated by Pope Paul III in 1540, so two years later would be 1542. Anyway, it became apparent that the number of 60 members, which was at first determined on by the Pope, had been found to be far too limited as in such an uncommonly large field of labor which the Jesuits occupied, what could be accomplished by 60 members only. On that account, Antichrist Pope Paul III issued a new bull on the 14th of March, 1543, which, by the words which, with which it commences, injunctum nobis, gives to Ignatius, then General of the Society of Jesus, the first one, the founder of the order, the power to take as many members as he wishes, a privilege of which advantage was, naturally enough, at once taken. What was even a still more valuable addition for the order, contained in the same bull, was an authorization, the effect was an authorization the effect of which was in fact immeasurable, and such as no order could hitherto boast. It was no less than that Loyola, as well as all future generals of the order up to the present Arturo Sosa in 2021, could, with the sanction of the most distinguished members in council, alter, expunge, or make additions to the laws of the society, or create entirely new regulations, according as it appeared under the circumstances to be most advantageous. And it was decreed that these altered and newly framed statutes, even in the case when the Roman chair had no knowledge of them, should have the same validity as if the Pope himself had confirmed them. Tom, I want to rest here for a second and let the people reflect a little bit on what I just read. And that is the point that I made in the last video, that when you read between the lines, you understand with this um, orders of the bull, the papal bull in Junctum Nobis, a bull which is the highest form of written authority a pope can issue and is directly after issuing uh, included into Roman Catholic canon law and unchangeable. It stays there forever. Yeah? Well, we have a little <laughs> discussion about that a little later when we speak of Dominus Acredemto Nostra, or other bulls that go against other bulls, but the point is when you read between the lines, and that's the point that I want to make, here, what I just read, you see that the order of the Society of Jesus is given a greater authority than the Pope. He can change the laws even without informing the Pope about it. Do you have a comment on this so far, Tom? Absolutely. What we've just read is proof positive that both the Vatican, the papacy, and the Jesuit, the Jesuit general, fully comprehend that this is a do-or-die matter for the Roman Catholic Church. Protestantism is a lethal threat. People reading the Bible for themselves and coming to the conclusions that the Protestant reformers did is a lethal threat to the Roman Catholic Church. And they have to pull out all the stops. As a matter of fact, what, may, what is also made evident in what we've just read is that the papacy understood the criticality of the situation at the time of the Protestant Reformation. And literally uncharacteristic of any time in papal history, the papacy literally took the reins of, of the mission of, 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 of uh, 
restoring the Roman Catholic Church completely into the hands of the Jesuit general. You know what that reminds me of, Tom? When Ronald Reagan so-called kneeled before Pope John Paul II and said, Holy Father, I give you my country. Now, isn't that This a is contract? the same capitulation that the white yeah. Pope does against the General of the Society of Jesus, saying, I am too weak. Here is all the power. I give you all the Roman Catholic Church to do whatever you feel, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. The, uh, the Jesuit order is the only uh, so-called holy order, and there are so many in the Roman Catholic Church. It's like... It's like uh, 10,000 different armies within the Roman Catholic Church, all, all with the mission of elevating the power of the Pope and the power of the Roman Catholic Church in the world. But the Jesuits were given permission and latitude and freedom, unlike any other order in the entire Roman Catholic Church. They were given unlimited power. They could write constitutions governing their organization, and if that, if whenever the need arises, the changes needed to be made, they could make those changes and implement those changes and completely change the character of the society uh, of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Jesuits and not even have to tell the Pope about it. The Pope is completely trusting, and if not completely trusting, completely subservient to the Jesuit order. The Roman Catholic papacy realizes that without the Jesuits, they don't stand a chance. The Protestant Reformation is too much for them. And so the Jesuits are completely, what's the word, scrupulously, uh, 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 unscrupulous, okay? No rules of morality, no rules of scripture, no law, no decency, no other form of human direction rules the Jesuit order. It's the whip of the whim of the Jesuit general that controls the order. And there's no such thing as right and wrong in the Roman Catholic Church. What is right is whatever prosecutes the war against Protestantism. And whatever's wrong is that which strengthens Protestantism or weakens the Jesuit resolve. Okay? And this is where we get the, the motto of the Jesuits is, is the, the end justifies the means. In other words, if the end in view is what you believe to be righteous then whatever means necessary to achieve that end is also righteous. And that includes genocide. Okay? That includes assassinations. That includes even killing the Pope if he should get in the way of the Jesuit general and his efforts to preserve the church and to elevate the papacy to global supremacy. And there are many examples for that. Many examples of all of it. We're not making up history as we go. Anybody can do this research for themselves. They've killed many popes who got in their way of trying to elevate the papacy to world supremacy. Any, any pope who seems to get, display a tinge of conscience over the diabolical things the Jesuits do and expresses it out loud all of a sudden that pope disappears and there's no autopsy given. Okay? History's full of it. They don't they don't brook any back sass from a pope. They are in charge of the Roman Catholic Church. They're invisible, they're clandestine, they're fifth column wherever they are and they work to uh, elevate the papacy to global supremacy. They're just like a duck on the water. They pedal as fast as they can, but they just glide. Nobody can see the movements of the Jesuits. Okay? They are in charge of elevating the papacy to both spiritual and temporal sovereignty in the world. King That's... of kings 
and Lord of Lords, so that the papacy fulfills. You see that flag that's on the on the on the on the on the, on the uh, computer screen right now, where it says Inquisition update. That's the papal flag. Okay, there's a uh, what appears at the right hand side in the white background, what appears to be a, a, a skull and crossbones. Okay, the skull represents the papal tiara. He is king over heaven, earth, and hell. He is both spiritual ruler of the world, represented by the golden key, and he is also the temporal ruler of the world, as depicted by the silver key. And those two keys are bound with a scarlet-colored cord, meaning if anybody tries to separate the spiritual power of the Pope from his temporal power, bloodshed will result. Anybody who tries to take any power and authority from the papacy, it ends up dead. And that's the Jesuits order uh, and to preserve this visible representation of what they intend to do for the papacy elevate the pope to both spiritual and temporal head in the world the papacy it's, it's codified in roman catholic canon law that the pope is the judge of every man and no man may judge him kind of sounds like christ doesn't it that's why he is antichrist you still need more proof? We've been proving it for 20 years, 15 to 20 years. I wish I'd have kept the ledger, but this is how long we've been doing it. No one's ever contradicted it. Nobody's ever gainsaid it. It is absolute truth. The man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy is none other than the papacy, and there's not even a close runner-up. Okay. I've described it this way before when you were in school. The best test that you could ever take is a true and false test. You knew you had 50% chance of getting the answer right, even if you didn't know the answer. You could just flip a coin, and heads I win, tails you lose, right? Well, in this case, there's only one choice. You don't even have to guess. Every answer is the Pope, the Pope, the Pope, the Pope. And you just don't have another option. There's only one answer to every question pertaining to who the Antichrist is. And that's what the Protestant Reformers knew. That's what Roman Catholics, even within the Roman Catholic Church, knew. That's what the kings of the earth knew. And they rebelled against the papacy and nearly liberated all of Europe. And there was even one time in history when Pope, uh, 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 what was his name, Pope Pius IX, during the, during the Civil War in 1865, said, I am Pope nowhere in the world but the United States. Check it out for yourself. And why is that? Because the United States was inundated with Jesuits. Roman Catholics had taken control of this country. They had taken control of the government. And uh, Protestants had to live with Roman Catholicism on every side. Politics, both local state, county, and federal, was being more and more controlled by Roman Catholics. And uh, that's where we are today. And not only that, we have no refuge in our churches anymore. There's no, there's no pastor in the churches that's going to commiserate with you about the Jesuits. Nobody's going to commiserate with you about the Jesuit-led counter-reformation. Nobody's going to commiserate with you about the Council of Trent. Not in any church in this country. So who do you trust? Do you realize that in the whole history of the Jesuit order, they've been kicked out of every country they ever set foot in? Sometimes Three and four times the Jesuits had to be expelled from all the nations of Europe. 
there may be only one nation somebody surmised that they couldn't recall whether the Jesuits had ever been kicked out of Belgium or not. Yeah, Everybody they were. Spain, pardon? 1826, they were kicked out of Belgium. Okay, well, maybe I've got the country wrong, but there's another nation over in, in that the, 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 they, they've been trying to find proof that they uh, were. The ever United kicked States out. of America, Tom. The United States of America, certainly, they have never kicked the Jesuits out of the country. Now, you got to understand, there's something wrong with that. If every nation in the world found fault with the Jesuits so much that they expelled them from their land, not once, not twice, not three times, but even four times kicked them out of their country for meddling in politics and religion and stirring up conflict, what in the world is wrong with the United States? The Jesuits have never been kicked out of this country. They are welcomed wherever they go. They, they enjoy celebrity status wherever they speak. They don't have to hide behind costumes and disguises. They walk up and down the streets of this country like they're holy men. And yet... They are the shock troops, the special forces of the man of sin, and their sworn duty is to destroy Protestant Christianity wherever it is found, leave nothing of them alive, destroy their churches, destroy their very lives if necessary. And they did that in this country, and nobody protested. Why do you suppose nobody protested? I've already answered the question a dozen times. There's no Protestantism. Nobody knows who the Antichrist is. Nobody knows what a Jesuit is. Nobody knows what the Counter of Reformation is. Nobody knows what the Council of Trent is. Nobody knows who the Antichrist is. Nobody knows what the Jesuit general is. We're as dumb as you can possibly be. Sorry to be so frank. But if we're ever to come out of this delusion, we've got to admit some really, really ugly things about ourselves and about what we believe. There's no hope for us if we don't. The Jesuits will just do with us as they please. Now, let me tell you a little bit about what they're doing with us. Since we no longer believe the Pope is the Antichrist and haven't for, what, 200 years in this country? It's our business now to make reparations for the papacy. To help restore him to the power that he enjoyed before the Protestant Reformation. King of kings and Lord of lords. And not just over Europe, but over the whole stinking world. And we're going to pay with it with our blood, we're going to pay with it, pay for it with our treasure, we're going to pay for it even with our spiritual lives, because we're deceived. We are cowards. We have left the faith. We profess Jesus with our mouth, but we deny that he ever set foot on terra firma when we say the 70th week of Daniel is future. What threat could we possibly be to the Jesuits? And it's obvious we're no threat because they've never even been criticized in this country. That is proof that no one can gainsay. That is proof positive of the complete spiritual depravity of American Christianity. And nobody can gainsay what I just said. Now, you can worry about chemtrails. You can worry about uh, uh, the flat earth. You can worry about the coronavirus. You can worry about the next war or the war that we're already in or the wars that are going to just inundate. Why? Because we've, we've got to pay the, pe the price for our sin. 
You see, 500 years ago, we upset the papacy. We kicked him off his throne, and we put Christ right back in it. But today, we've kicked Christ off of this planet, and we put the Pope front and center. King of kings and Lord of lords. Why? Because we believe the lie called futurism. The greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. The most consequential error and deception ever concocted in the flames of the pit of hell by Satan himself. We bought it hook, line, and sinker. We're all guilty as charged, and all we can do is do what they did in Nineveh. And the first thing you can do is get the heck out of the churches because they work for the Jesuit general. It looks like Christianity, but it's not. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you, Tom. Continue reading in this part of the Griesinger book. The author says, Although it seems almost madness that a pope should impart a privilege of this description to any general of any order, it thus stands verbally written in the bull Injunctum nobis. It, in fact, made the individual in question thereby almost independent of the papal chair, and at the same time a despot of such extraordinary power that it was calculated to render all states distrustful to him. For instance, does not every government solicitous for the welfare of its subjects and for its own stability require that the rules and constitution of all such societies as that of the Jesuits should be submitted for its acceptance and toleration? Would it not carefully examine beforehand the contents of the same to ascertain exactly whether they were in accordance with the laws of the country? or whether there might be any possibility that the wheel of the state might be undermined thereby? Certainly, every wise government would naturally thus act, and the Jesuits, therefore, as well as all other orders in the different countries into which they had penetrated, had to submit their constitution for approval. How would it be, then, if the general, after permission being granted, was pleased to alter its constitution and incorporate among its rules some resolution, perhaps highly dangerous to the state. Truly, the above described authorization might well startle and be a warning to any state in allowing the order of Jesuits to become rooted among them, while this papal bull made it indeed a chameleon, whereby every succeeding general might be able to give a new color to the rules, so that consequently no trust could be placed at all in them. Ignatius then obtained a new privilege, through another decree, published on the 5th of June 1545, which also contributed not a little to the power of the new order. The Pope thereby conferred on the Jesuits the right to ascend any pulpit wherever they went, to teach in all places and to establish professorial chairs everywhere, to hear confessions and grant absolutions for every sin, even for such sins as the papal chair had reserved for itself to consider, to exempt from all church penalties and curses, to dispense with vows and pilgrimages, and to order as well other good works, to read Mass in all places and at all hours, 
to administer the sacraments without necessarily having the acquiescence of the local priesthood or even the bishop of the place. This was once more an enormous advantage for the Jesuits over rival orders. By the way, rival orders, the Dominicans and the Franciscans most and for all, and in the same year, 1542, the Jesuits were given the Inquisition into their hands and they took it out from the Dominicans. From that moment on, the Dominicans were only stooges to the Jesuits, and that's up to today. Yeah? So this was once more an enormous advantage for the Jesuits over rival orders, none of whom ever possessed such extensive privileges. And, indeed, it caused them to burst with envy. What embittered the ordinary priesthood still more against the black cloaks was that in granting absolution they never imposed any very severe punishment, even for grave sins, thereby snatching from their rivals many penitents and consequently depriving them of no inconsiderable part of their income and influence. It's again all about the money. Huh? But indignation was of no avail to them, and even the complaints of distinguished bishops had no weight with the Pope, who entertained a particular affection for the Jesuits and, in very truth, on good grounds. So far, the book from Theodor Griesinger, and I just read to you only a mere two of 850 pages, and I can tell you the whole book is interesting as this. This leads us back to the book of Steve Wahlberg that we will probably turn to next broadcast, where we will continue in the chapter of the Battle of the Isms and go again into the founding and uh, even here and there uh, expulsion of the Jesuit order in few countries, as it is written here. And um, I didn't plan it to be such a long uh, excourse away from the book of Steve Wahlberg, because Tom and I, uh, we are already looking forward every Wednesday when the reading is done to the next Wednesday when we come back to read this book, because we are very, very grateful that Steve Wahlberg put this book together, and we are very much looking forward to work through that book. We still have 111 pages to go, and we will continue this, I can promise you, next week, but I think the little excourse we did today into the Jesuit order is of a real importance, and I also say I will put a comment on my video when I upload this video and I will pin that comment so that it is always on top and you can give it a thumbs up if you want Tom and me to discuss, to discuss with you the Jesuit oath once and for all. Tom did that on his broadcast as far as I know on Inquisition Update years and years ago. I did it on Nothing but the truth, when I was with Michael Adams, when I was first coming to the internet, I think in the end of 2014, the very first time, and I even made a little mistake and read the oath of the Knights of Columbus for a big part, but that's, <laughs> except for a few words, the same. Uh, so I did it there, but Tom and I have never read and discussed that together, and maybe if Tom is willing, Maybe when you show enough thumbs up in that comment, Tom will be willing to do that with me on probably some other time, but on a Tuesday night, we'll see, whatever. I just think, thank you very much for your time this hour. I hope you learned something and I hope you understand the severance and the importance of the subject that was absolutely at hand. There was no better moment for this one broadcast to sway a little bit aside from, this, from the matter of the book of Steve Wahlberg, to speak about the importance of the Council of Trent, of the founding of the Jesuit order, and we are going to continue in that, then at this moment when Steve Wahlberg himself mentioned that in his book. So, I hope that you have been helped by what you have heard and seen today in this broadcast, and I can only give you the advice to do your own research in that regard. Not to believe Tom, not to believe me, but find it out for yourself, because the truth that you find for yourself is the truth you will most value. And now I will leave a final comment 
for Brother Tom. Yes, and if the listeners paid close attention to the last few paragraphs that you read, they can certainly understand now why the Jesuits were kicked out of every land they ever set foot on. They were infiltrators to every government. They were a domestic and a foreign threat to national security to every nation they ever set foot on. Let me just one, let, let, let me just correct you in one word, Tom. You said they were. I say they are. Well, certainly. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole point. Yeah, people it, have it, to understand that these laws, these bulls are still in working today. Yeah. What was here written in 1543 by Pope Paul III is as much the truth with Pope Francis I today in 2021. So every government in this world, including the United States, I will add, understands the purpose, the goal, and the intention, and the history of the Jesuits. There are no secrets. Now, you must ask yourself the question, if the government of the United States knows that much about the Jesuits, why are they allowed to exist in this country? If there ever was a domestic threat to the security of the United States of America, it is the Jesuit order. That's a fact recognized by every other government in the world, demonstrated by their repeatedly kicking the Jesuits out of their countries. So why not the United States? Their constitutions are secret. Their oath is supposedly secret. Their intentions are supposedly secret. But trust me, our government knows all they need to know about the Jesuits to see them exactly for what they are an instrument of extension of the power and the supremacy, the unstoppable, the unquenchable, the unsurpassable power and authority, both spiritual and temporal, of the man of sin in Rome, the Antichrist, the papacy. The CIA knows all this. The FBI knows all this. The National Security Agency knows all this. Most of our elected officials know all this, especially those who hold high office in Congress who are Roman Catholic. The highest generals, admirals of our militaries know this, some of which are even Jesuits themselves. Now, again, what is the purpose of the Jesuits? to destroy Protestantism wherever it is found by any means, fair or foul. And what is a Protestant? One who declares, believes in his heart and confesses with his mouth that Jesus is the Christ and the papacy is the Antichrist. And let me tell you something. Every government of the world has acknowledged what a threat that is to any civil government and has repeatedly kicked the Jesuits out of their country. Never once has the United States done so, and that should speak volumes to every listener on this, on this channel. That's the reason why I called my, my, my website Inquisition Update. The war against Protestantism will never end until Christ returns. They have at their disposal every means of destruction, the most sophisticated war-making material ever devised by man at their disposal to destroy Protestantism lock, stock, and barrel. 
every man, woman, and child on this planet is known by the Jesuits, whether he's Protestant or Catholic. They have the means, the motive, the permission to carry out their warfare, even by our own government. That's the only conclusion, the only logical conclusion to which one can arrive. And I'll let you think about it till we talk about it again. Thanks, Yerk. The President DeJoya's invitation started me thinking about the many similarities between Jesuits and News Corporation. Uh, but both the Jesuits and News Corporation attract highly talented people from all over the globe. Both the Jesuits and News Corporation like to challenge the status quo. And both the Jesuits and News Corporation have a reputation for independence and innovation. Of course, there are some differences. I don't want to discourage anyone who might be considering the priesthood. Uh, but I will tell you that at News Corporation, we don't insist on vows of poverty or chastity. Um, and as chief executive, I can tell you that I'm sometimes not sure about the degree of obedience either. Uh, the Earth Summit Environmental Leadership Act, as this is known, presents us with an opportunity to follow up on the important work of the Earth Summit to develop its blueprint, Agenda 21, for envir global environmental action. DUP leader Ian Paisley was jostled, punched and then dragged out of the European Parliament today after interrupting a speech by the Pope. The disturbance came within seconds of the Pope starting to speak. Other Euro MPs responded angrily when Dr Paisley heckled the Pope, saying he was the Antichrist. Permit me to say how much I... I call you to order and I ask you to stop this disturbance. For the second time, Mr. Paisley, for the second time, Mr. Paisley, I call you to order and I ask you to respect the dignity of this House. Mr. Paisley, I now exclude you from this house and for the remainder of the city. Mr. Paisley claims he was punched and that he later received a personal apology from the head of security for failing to protect him. The poster stated simply, John Paul II Antichrist, a reference to the view supported by Archbishop Cranmer in Reformation times that by claiming to be God's earthly representative, popes have usurped the position of Christ. He remained unrepentant despite being accused of being a bigot. Well, let me say this. If the honor of Christ is at stake, I would put my whole political career on the line for the honor of Jesus Christ in his truth. I happen to be a Protestant by conviction, and I'm not going to sell my Protestant heritage.